I want to start off by thanking Jay and his excellent team for setting up this TED event and giving my 18 minutes of fame, hopefully. And I also want to uh, thank Ty for giving us a very mellow introduction to this afternoon. Thank you, Ty. And then I want to ask all of you a rhetorical question. How would you feel if I came up to you and offered to take away your memory? Not very happy, probably. Without your memories, who are you? Without an identity, you don't know who you are. Without any memory of the past, how do you decide what you're going to do in the future? How do you take any decisions? End up like the poor guy in Memento, right? Now let me offer you another question which is less rhetorical. What if I offered to give you a memory which was 700 years long? Would you like to remember what happened 700 years ago? Maybe that would be a more attractive proposition. And in a sense, that's what I can do. Now, I'm not a Singaporean, but I've lived in this area for 42 years. I feel myself to be a citizen of the world, actually. And many of you also will feel, as I do, that whatever has to do with human beings has to do with me. Whatever has to do with the long-distance trading globalization of the world 700 years ago has very likely having something to do with your ancestors and has something probably to do with the way you still live your lives today. Now, what does Singapore got to do with this? Well, everybody thinks of Singapore in February 1819 is looking like a wilderness like this, with the little houses along the riverbank, a few intrepid Chinese gongbeer plantations, some pirates lurking offshore, and that's about it. And this is true. This is basically what it looked like in 1819. Who would think that the 700 years before today, Singapore was a much different place than it had been? It was actually a bustling trading port frequented by people from all nations from the South China Sea, Java Sea, to the Indian Ocean. Not many people would have that image of Singapore. And said you would have the idea that whatever the Malayan Isles and other ancient sources say about Singapore, the, it was a, basically a myth of the five ancient kings of Singapore. Um, well basically, this is nothing else than a, a kind of a fantasy uh, dreamed up by ancient Malay writers. And so the whole idea of how Singapore got its name, of course, would have obviously mythological value since there were no lions were all told in Southeast Asia in the ancient past. Well, then Raffles came, came the spark of life to the Temenggong in Singapore, and Singapore became a great trading port, right? Now, why does Singapore figure in Raffles' thought at all? Well, before he even came here, in 1818, as he was trying to get out of the harbor in England, he already wrote this letter back to his patroness, the Duchess of Somerset. Don't be surprised if I send you a letter from the ancient site of Singapore. But why did he think Singapore was an ancient site? And why was he going there when he had never set foot here? Well, um, this is uh, what his, he landed in 1819, and one of his uh, ship captains, John Crawford, said this. Um, he looked around the ground, and he mentioned that Raffles has seen this as the ancient classic ground of Singapore. And that um, it was marked by this large uh, earthen rampart along the edge of the ancient site. This is January 1819. Well, Raffles collected the oldest known version of the Malayan Isles. And he read it, and in the Malayan Isles, it has the story of the five ancient kings, and it tells about how Singapore was the first great Malay trading port. Now, this is probably not literally true, but it's the way the Malays of 1819 actually thought of Singapore as their first great settlement. It was a location which they still thought it was having great potential, and that's what Raffles was actually banking on when he came to Singapore, is using Singapore's ancient brand as an advertisement for his new port. That was his basic idea. And when he came here, he found abundant evidence that he was not making this up. He found the old Malay Wall. This is a map of 1825, which has still not been properly studied. You will see, however, that it has the old lines of Singapore running where Stamford Road is today. That was where an ancient rampart was. And so the second resident, whose name is a slightly different spelling of Crawford, it's not the same guy, John Crawford, came here in 1822, and he described the ancient wall, saying that it was 16 feet wide at the base um, and 9 feet high, about uh, 5 meters by 2.5 meters or so. He mentioned that uh, there was an ancient stone inscription at the mouth of the Singapore River, which was later on blown up by the British in 1843, courtesy of the military who were building Fort Fullerton. And uh, now one of the fragments is still in the National Museum. There were three, but the other two were sent to Calcutta. And I went to Calcutta with the head of the Singapore National Museum back in 1990. 
met the head of the Calcutta Museum, and they said, yeah, they probably have lots of old stuff from outside of India in their basement, and they'll check. If they ever find it, they'll let us know. I envision that something like the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you go into the giant warehouse, it's somewhere in this giant warehouse in Calcutta. So we don't know what it says, but we can tell it's a pre-Malay writing, it's the kind of Kauri script that was used in Sumatra and Java in the pre-Islamic period. It was a giant stone, this big, this wide, it had 50 lines of writing. There was a lot of writing going on in pre-Islamic Singapore. And Crawford also wandered around the hill of Fort Canning, but that time it was called the Bukit Larang, the Forbidden Hill. It was called Forbidden because in the ancient times the Malays said they could only ascend the hill where their palaces, palace of the ancestors had been if they were given permission. So he went up there and found a bunch of brick ruins of good quality. And in between these ruins were scattered lots and lots of um, Chinese pottery and coins. There was also the remains of an ancient garden. And here you see the little green lines on the foot of what's now Fort Canning. That's where the Singapore First Botanic Garden was set up. There's a lot of interesting parallels between what Raffles found when he came here and where he set up his first establishments. He put his house on top of the hill where he thought the old Malay palace had been. He set up his first garden where he thought the old Malay palace garden had been. And they found abundant evidence of ancient trade on the hill. Lots and lots of Chinese coins dating back long before 700 years even, back to the Tang Dynasty. And we have also found since then Besides lots of Chinese coins, we've also found Sri Lankan coins, lots of other evidence of ancient trade. In other words, Singapore's ancient population was literate and had a money economy. And we didn't find the, the, the gold bracelet here, unfortunately. It was found by people digging a reservoir in Fort Canning in 1928. But as you can see, it's an extremely ornate piece. What we find usually tend to be these little scraps that must have fallen off some workbench of a goldsmith. <laughs> uh, but so we keep on digging. Um, and now this is the king of West Sumatra in the 14th century, the same period as we now believe Tomasic was a very famous trading port. You see the guy's belt is exactly the same as the one found on Fort Canning. Same Kala head decoration. Seems to be another piece of evidence that Fort Canning was in fact a very important political center in the 14th century. Now, Raffles believed the Malayan Isles was true, that's why he set up his port here, for we're not from the Malayan Isles, depiction of Singapore, we wouldn't be sitting here today. We'd be sitting maybe somewhere in Sumatra or on Karimun Island or somewhere like that. But the Raffles believed this based on the Malayan Isles, but there were other British before him. He wasn't the first Brit to explore this region. This is the map of 1709. Again, sitting in the British Library today, showing the ancient Straits of Singapore, as it writes it here. And that's the entrance, of course, to Keppel Harbor today. And that rock sticking up out of the water that's another landmark of Singapore that's now missing, courtesy of British military explosives. It used to be called Lot's Wife in English. It was called the Batu Brulai, or Sail Rock in Malay. And the Chinese knew it also as the Dragon's Tooth. So and they, even before the British came, the Portuguese came. And the Portuguese made the first intact map of the Singapore. You see there are a lot of names here from 1604. You'll still recognize Sunan Bado is there, Tanamera is there, all these places on the east coast, those are old sites. And you will see Bahamati, of course, you all know that's the old name for what's now been turned around called Sentosa, in the hope of giving it a somewhat better image, instead of stabbed in the back, which is what it literally means. <laughs> and you also see there is a word Shabandaria, which is a Portuguese corruption of the Malay word Shabandar, harbor master. There was a harbor master still in Singapore, in the Singapore estuary, uh, around 1600. So we can even go back further. I'm peeling back the layers of the past. We're now back in the 14th century. These are the geography names of Singapore known to the 14th century Chinese. Singapore was called Damasi, which is a transliteration of Tomasi. And then there was the Long Yaman, the Dragon's Tooth Strait, Keppel Harbor. And then there was the area around Fort Canning, which they called Pansu, or Pansu, or Spring of Water. We know about this because the first eyewitness account of trade outside of China by a Chinese merchant was written by Wang Danyuan, 1349. And this is his kind of life history. That's all we know of him, basically. He didn't tell us much about himself. But he traveled around Southeast Asia twice in the 1330s. And he gives a lot of space in his accounts to both Tomasic and also Pansu, 
Fort Canning, and also the Long Yaman. So he gives a lot of attention to this region. He talks about the different kinds of trade items that were found here. And he also mentions there was another place, there were two places, two different societies side by side. One was what you might expect um, based on stereotypes of Singapore as a pirate's lair. That was where Blakamati got its name, from the pirates who used to take their captives there and apparently chop them up. But at the same time, he makes this very strange comment that the Chinese live side by side. And on the one hand, their ships are getting attacked by the pirates. On the other hand, he says the Chinese are living there. I think he probably mixed up his two accounts. One had to do with this uh, Long Yaman area, the other probably had to do with Panshur. But there were trading goods, things like tin dust, laka wood, and so forth. And the Chinese were also doing trade, apparently, with the pirates in the Long Yaman Straits. But the other, other area, Panshur, was an honest area. There was a ruler, so it was an organized system of government. And this is where people wore much more elaborate clothing, for example. I think he's talking about batik when he talks about red oil cloth that they wore. And they had a much more luxurious type of market here in the Panshur area. So, he says the people are honest, they wear this red oil cloth, they even had an industry, they made salt by boiling seawater, they also made some kind of alcoholic spirits, and um, basically they traded with iron, goods, pottery, and so forth. So we're now actually, I mean, I've been doing this work for 25 years, I published my first report in 1985, and it still doesn't seem to be very well known. So our latest gig is to try to do an online computer game called World of Tomasek. You can all Google it up in their back seats there. And you'll find these are some of our, our avatars who you can be. Everything from a Buddhist to a female nun to the Laksamana of ancient Singapore, if you want to be. And hopefully this will be ready in another uh, couple of months for you to start testing out. Maybe this will get us the credibility that we never got from a scientific publication. And this is the, the, this is the palace that you will be able to visit, hopefully, you know, online in a couple more months, or at least uh, by the end of this year. So, uh, now Wang Taiyuan doesn't just mention the trade in Singapore, he also mentions that Singapore was being attacked by the Siamese at this period, the Xian, or uh, Shan, similar to today's Shan people. And he mentions that uh, Singapore actually had a fort wall. They could shut up their gates and they could hold off a siege lasting a month. So that does make sense then that when Raffles arrived, he still found this old Malay wall around Stanford Road, which again, we know the British you know, dug up. It's not there anymore. But this is our version of the Siamese ship coming into the harbor. So you'll be able to see this happening also. So we have dug about uh, eight different places now between the Singapore River and Stanford Road, Fort Canning, and the Padang. And in all that area, anywhere that there's an empty space, we found 14th century artifacts. It was a city of about 85 hectares. Um, one of the centers was around what is still known as the Karamat Iskandar Shah today. As you can see, this has gone through many different avatars of its own within the last 50 years. But it was probably one of the ancient ruins that Crawford originally saw. And this, these are the two old gentlemen that used to hang out there, the bird man and the cat man. And the birds ate the seeds, so I guess, and then the cats ate the birds, perhaps. I'm not sure. <laughs> But uh, now today you will go there and you'll see we have reconstructed what we think was one of the types of buildings that stood on Fort Canning in the 14th century. Brick foundations, uh, upper uh, wooden structures and so forth, a kind of a balai pandopo. And there was a kind of a forbidden spring as well. Now forbidden springs were important in ancient Southeast Asian palaces. Uh, this is a 16th century Javanese rendering of a palace garden with a bathing pool. And uh, when the, Br the British came, Munchi Abdullah, Raffles Malay teacher, mentioned that there was a forbidden spring where supposedly the Malay rulers' wives and daughters used to bathe. And that's probably on the side which is still facing the old River Valley Road swimming pool. So another really interesting parallel between early British period and the ancient 14th century. Now we've dug out a lot of those sites just on Fort Canning itself. That was the area where, of course, we believed had been the elite residential area. And all our work is done by volunteers. Um, we've now set up a nice outdoor display on the site. We actually left a big part of the pit open so people can see where we actually found things. You can see the different layers of time, like a layer cake, if you go up to Fort Canning today. We've also dug things like the Padang. The whole Padang is a giant archaeological site, never been disturbed. We just did a few little test pits. And you can see in the bottom of the one test pit, nice white sand. This, again, is a reference to the Malayan Isles 
when the original ruler, Sri Tribwana, looked across the Straits of Singapore, saw this nice beach, this blindingly white beach, and he said, what's that land over there? And his followers said, that's Tomasic, your highness. So he came, saw the lion, changed it to Lion City. The beach is still there. It's under the Padang. You see the nice white you know, sugary sand, that's still under the Padang. Then you see the black layer, that's what the 14th century population left behind. That's their charcoal and their ashes and so forth. And then you see the upper layers, that's the British period. Now what do we find? We find tons of materials from the 14th century. Hundreds and thousands of glass beads, suggesting maybe Singapore had a kind of Peranakan addiction to bead wearing. All the green pottery that you could wish for, one of the most popular colors. Um, thousands of bowls of this type. Incense burners and whiteware, indicating there was also some kind of religious activities involving the burning of incense. Little tiny pieces of white porcelain as well, such as this little character. He's only about that big in real life. Um, but uh, he's wearing a turban, as you can see. Now, he was probably part of a stage showing you end dynasty theater in the form of a pillow. A rather unique Chinese type of artifact, and they were actually using these on Fort Canning. We find these little sculptures as well. We find a fair amount of really Southeast Asian sculptural art, nothing of a religious nature so far. Of course, this is in the newspaper today. Those of you who saw the Straits Times life section today, this is juxtaposed with Pompeii. We're not quite as grandiose as Pompeii yet, but this is one of our most interesting characters we've discovered here as well. Lots and lots of Chinese blue and white. This is some of the oldest blue and white in the world. Singapore was one of the first markets in the world to take a liking to this new form of consumer goods. One of which is in the form of a compass. It's the only known ancient Chinese porcelain compass. It was on Fort Canning. Now, the Chinese had invented the compass a couple hundred years before the 14th century. Mostly they were using it for navigation, but also for feng shui. That may be what they were doing on Fort Canning. But we have Chinese archaeologists who actually come to Singapore to see our compass. And uh, we have lots and lots of other disposable goods, such as these uh, jars. They were actually throwing away perfectly good 14th century jars. They were that prosperous. And uh, they, don't, they didn't stop bringing things in after 1400, when Malacca was founded. In 1400, Malacca was founded, but Singapore was still inhabited. We find Ming Dynasty wares, places like uh, Empress Place, right next to the Asian Civilization's building even in the Kalong area. So Singapore did keep on being used right up until the 1600, and then it seems to have been abandoned for perhaps 200 years. So you have actually a 700-year-old history. You have a 700-year-old memory which you can tap, and it's being destroyed almost every day. So we are still trying to do our best to at least recover some of this memory for not only Singaporeans, but for all of us, including myself. Thank you very much.